really glad to see that so many of you are here to participate in my defense today, even though the circumstances are less fun than usual. So I will present a summary of the work that I have been doing during the last few years, and which is compiled in my thesis, which has the title Colloidal Interactions and Arrested Dynamics of Cellulose Nanofibrils. So before presenting the actual results, I will give you a brief introduction to provide a context to my work. So one of the main environmental problems of today's society is that we use more, um, more of the natural resources than what is sustainable. This of course have to change and we need to get better at both reusing and recycling the materials that we have. But we also need to use materials based on renewable resources to a greater extent. And one great source for the building stones of such materials is the forests, which covers large parts of especially the northern hemisphere. And here in Sweden, it covers around 70% of all the land and the forest industry is uh, extremely important for the Swedish economy. Wood-based materials have been used for a very long time in um, construction materials, in packaging materials, and in papers. But more recently, more focus has been directed towards developing new materials with properties that can compete with those of fossil-based plastics. So the main components of wood are lignin, hemis hemicelluloses, and cellulose. And cellulose is a straight chain polymer, which primary function in wood is to provide tensile strength and stiffness. Uh, you can find it in the cell wall of wood fibers in the form of cellulose and nanofibrils. And these fibrils can be liberated from the wood fibers. And they are long and very slender particles with widths of just a few nanometers and lengths in the order of one micrometer. So these nanofibrils have many properties that are highly desirable in many material applications. They have a high tensile strength and stiffness, high aspect ratio, which means that they are much longer than they are wide. They are low density and they have surfaces that are suitable for many types of chemical modification. And they are also very durable. And as a consequence, these fibrils can be used in many different applications, such as they can be the uh, reinforcing units in composites, they can be used in uh, transparent films, in highly porous aerogels, and they can also be used in barrier films and as rheology modifiers. So cellulose nanofibrils or CNFs can be liberated from, um, from wood fiber by mechanical disintegration of wood pulp. And in the image to your left, you can see uh, what the wood pulp can look like. And in the middle, you see the gel-like suspension of CNFs that is obtained after the disintegration. And this suspension just have a cellulose con uh, content of around one to two weight percent. So the rest is actually water. And by further diluting it and treating it with ultrasonication, one can obtain a dispersion of more or less completely liberated fibrils. But this disintegration requires high amounts of energy and uh, um, in order to enable a CNF preparation that is economically feasible, uh, different types of pretreatment methods have been developed that can reduce the energy consumption. Most of these pretreatment methods involves the introduction of charges to the cellulose uh, nanofibrils. The charges increases the swelling of the fibers and therefore facilitates the, um, the separation of, or the disintegration of them. But the charges also contribute to a higher colloidal stability of the final dispersions. And I will come back to this in a couple of slides. So two of the most common types of pretreatment methods that I have mainly used in my work is carboxymethylation and carboxylation by tempo-mediated oxidation. Dispersions of CNFs is an example of a colloid and uh, some of you might not know what a colloid is so I will explain it. It is uh, generally described as a mixture of 
one uh, discrete objects of a one substance that are uh, dispersed in a continuous medium of another substance. And these objects should have at least one dimension in the nanoscale. And most CNF-based materials are prepared start, starting from such colloidal dispersions. And the properties of the final materials are to a large extent governed by, by how well the fibrils are distributed and dispersed within the material. So therefore it is of course important that the fibrils in the original dispersion are also well dispersed. So they should be as liberated as or as individualized as possible in the dispersed state, and they should not have formed these uh, aggregates. And in order to, uh, uh, to achieve this, it is important to have an understanding of the colloidal behavior of the CNFs. And the theory most commonly used to describe the colloidal behavior is the DLVO theory, which was developed in the 1940s. It states that the stability of a colloidal dispersion is governed by two different interactions, the double layer interaction and the van der Waals interactions. All charged particles are surrounded by a cloud of counter ions. And as two charged particles approach each other, there we, this will create an osmotic pressure, which causes repulsion between the particles. And that is the double layer interaction. And uh, um, the extent of this repulsion is, uh, it depends on salt concentration, and it can be characterized by the Debye length. Van der Waals interactions exist between any pair of molecules or particles, and it arises from the correlated electron motions of the materials. For most systems, the Van der Waals interactions are attractive. So the DLVO theory then states that <coughs> that uh, the total um, energy of interaction uh, of the system is then given as the sum of the double layer interaction and the van der Waals interactions. And in the graph, you can see an example of what the distance dependence of the interactions may look like. So at short separation distances, the van der Waals attraction overcomes the double layer repulsion, leading to an aggregated system. But for charged particles, such as CNFs, uh, if the salt concentration is low, there may, may be a substantial energy barrier that prevents this, uh, this aggregation. But if the salt concentration is then increased, the height of this energy barrier decreases and the system aggregates. The DLVO theory is very useful for, uh, for understanding the colloidal stability, uh, and it can be used to accurately predict the colloidal behavior of many systems. But there are many assumptions made in the derivations of the equations that this model is based on. And as a consequence, its use is very limited for some systems, for example, systems that contain very small particles or particles with high surface charge densities or multivalent ions. And as we will see later on, the DLVO theory is not always enough to describe the colloidal behavior of CNFs. So the main objective of my PhD work has been to increase the fundamental understanding of the colloidal properties of CNFs. In my thesis and in this presentation, I have divided the achieved results into two different parts. The first part focuses on the arrested dynamics in CNF systems. We have studied arrested states of CNFs and, uh, and also the mechanisms that cause their formation. And we have also investigated the dynamics in arrested states and dispersions. In the second part of the presentation, I will present results from projects where we have used the different strategies of altering the colloidal interactions in CNF systems. We have done this by changing the counter ions to the surface charges, and we have used polymers either as additives or grafted to the CNFs. And we have then evaluated the impact on the colloidal behavior. So I will start by just giving you some background information of the arrested dynamics of CNFs, and then I will move on to presenting the results from this part. And the dispersions of uh, cellulose nanofibrils can be either in 
in a, di a semi-dilute regime, depending on concentration. In a dilute dispersion, the distance between the CNFs uh, is large and collisions are infrequent. But as the concentration is increased and it reaches the semi-dilute regime, frequent and the colloidal interactions are also more important. If the concentration is further increased, there is a transition from a dispersion to a volume spanning arrested state, which is a non-flowing and gel-like state. And arrested states can also be formed from semi-dilute dispersions if the chemical environment is changed either by adding salt or by decreasing pH. If the same thing is done to a dilute dispersion, the result will be a dispersion of CNF aggregates instead. Uh, colloidal arrested states can be divided into colloidal glasses and gels. And the main difference between these two lies in the interparticle interactions. In colloidal glasses, the interparticle interactions are net repulsive and they form as a consequence of uh, decreased particle or increased particle mobility constraints caused by the proximity of the neighboring particles. Colloidal gels, on the other hand, is, are based on attractive interparticle interactions, which causes the particles to uh, aggregate or associate into a percolated network. Um, a consequence of the different interactions is that uh, colloidal glasses can usually be easily, uh, they are easily redispersible by dilution, while colloidal gels are generally not. And one characterization technique that I have used for studying the transition between a dispersion and an arrested state is dynamic light scattering, DLS. In a DLS measurement, one obtains a correlation curve, and from this correlation curve, the, uh, um, the hydrodynamic size of the particles that you are studying can be obtained, and this is what this technique is most commonly used for. But for suspensions that are non-flowing uh, and the particle dynamics is very restricted, the intercept of this correlation curve starts to decrease. And this happens for our CNFs when they form uh, arrested states. So therefore the dynamic light scattering measurements could be used to detect the arrested state uh, transition. So in paper one, we studied the transition between a semi-dilute dispersion and a, an arrested state upon increasing the concentration. And we did this for a couple of different types of CNFs. And in this paper, we also used cellulose nanocrystals, uh, which is another type of nanocellulose, which are shorter and have a higher degree of crystallinity compared with the CNFs. We detected the arrested state threshold concentration for these different nanocelluloses. And we did this both by using DLS, like I just described, but we also performed inverted cuvette tests where we slowly increased the concentration of the samples by evaporation of water. And we then detected a change in flow behavior by inverting the sample cuvettes. So the results from these measurements showed us that the threshold concentration varies with particle aspect with the inverse of the particle aspect ratio. And the particle aspect ratio is then the ratio between particle length and width. And this trend is actually consistent with what is expected for elongated particles that form colloidal glasses. So this result indicated that these systems could be classified as colloidal glasses uh, and that the interparticle interactions are then repulsive, net repulsive. Um, but in order to further support or to dismiss this, we performed dilution experiments where we diluted the arrested states and we, um, we use dynamic light scattering to see if the correlation curve intercept remained low after dilution or if it increased to the original values. So the graph to your right shows the correlation curve intercepts versus the time after dilution for one type of CNF and one type of CNC. The dashed lines indicate the, uh, the the values for the intercept of the original dispersions at concentrations far below the threshold concentration. 
So as you can see, within a few days after dilution, the intercept did increase and they reached values that were very close to the original ones. So this result also supported the classification of these systems as colloidal glasses. So we further wanted to uh, investigate what would happen if we decrease the AA repulsion in these systems, either by adding sodium chloride or by adding hydrochloric acid. So we did that to some arrested states and we performed the same dilution experiment again. And in this case, we can actually see that the intercept, it increases slightly after dilution, but it remains as at values that are considerably lower than the original ones. So this result indicates that when we decrease the interparticle repulsion, um, we, we get another type of arrested states which are more based on attractive interactions. So the results from these measurements then show us that the concentration induced arrested states of CNFs uh, are based on, uh, or they form due to increased particle mobility constraints and can be classified as colloidal glasses. But if the double layer repulsion is diminished, another type of arrested state is formed where the particles most likely have aggregated into a percolated network due to the van der Waals attractions, and that this could be classified as a colloidal gel. In paper two, we continued the characterization of different colloidal states by studying the dynamics in semi-dilute dispersions and concentration-induced arrested states. I will now introduce a concept that can be used for describing the different concentration regimes for rod-like particles. And that is the crowding factor, which is most commonly used for macroscopic pulp fibers, but it can be applied to CNFs as well. Well, so the crowding factor refers to the number of fibers that occupy the volume of a sphere with a diameter equal to the, to the fiber length. And it can be shown that um, a crowding factor of one corresponds to the transition between dilute and semi-dilute dispersion, and that there is a rigidity threshold at a crowding factor of 60. And this corresponds to the concentration where each fiber has on average three contact points with other fibers. And therefore the system has the potential to form a network of considerable mechanical strength. So in this work, we studied the dynamics by using latex particles as tracer particles. And we then measured their diffusion in CNF of different concentration. Um, and uh, the particles that we used, they were carboxylated and uh, fluorescently labeled. And we measured their diffusion by uh, fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. The translational diffusion constant of a spherical particle can be described by the Stokes-Einstein equation, which states that the diffusion is a function of temperature, solvent viscosity, and particle size. And for the analysis of such tracer diffusion measurements, uh, an approach that is commonly used is called the Langvin and Rondeles model. And this model states that the uh, that the diffusion of the tracer particles depends on the ratio between particle size and mesh size of the network, which in our case then consists of the CNFs. If the particles are smaller than the mesh size, the diffusion is essentially the same as in water. And this means that the, uh, uh, the ratio between the diffusion constant in CNF to that in water should be approximately one. But if the, if the particle size is bigger than the mesh size, then the, uh, um, the diffusion is governed by the macroscopic viscosity of the CNF dispersion. And, um, um, and CNF dispersions in this concentration range commonly have a viscosity that varies with the concentration to the power of approximately two. And therefore, the ratio between the diffusion constant in CNF to that in water should vary with the concentration to the power of approximately minus two.
So the results from our measurements, um, here we have plotted the relative diffusion constant versus CNF concentration for 40 nanometer tracer particles. And we can see that the diffusive behavior is very different below and above 0.2 weight percent. And by linear fitting, we can obtain two different slopes. Uh, so by doing this for a couple of uh, other particle sizes, we obtained the following slopes. So because of the logarithmic scale of this graph, a slope of a minus two would correspond to a diffusive behavior that is uh, governed by CNF viscosity. And as you can see, that was actually achieved for the 20 and 40 nanometer particles in CNF concentrations about 0.2 weight percent. At lower concentrations, the slope was less steep, meaning that the diffusion was affected less than what was expected by viscosity, but it was still slower than in water. So this can not be explained by the Langvin and Rondeles model. And we think that this is because of the dynamics of the CNFs themselves. At these rather low concentrations, the CNFs are probably too mobile to be considered a static network. And that is why we can't use this approach. Uh, at 0.2 weight percent, the crowding factor is 90, which is then above the rigidity threshold. So therefore the CNFs has they have probably formed a more rigid network, which can then be considered static. And in this network, the diffusion of the smaller particles are it's governed by viscosity. But for the even larger particles, the diffusion is more slowed down than that. For the 200 and 500 nanometer particles, it was even too slow to measure. And we believe that this is because of a caging phenomenon. So the particles get caged in the CNF network due to the high number of contact points between the particles and the CNFs in combination with the high rigidity of the network. For the 500 nanometer spheres, we actually had a third uh, concentration regime between 0.1 and 0.2 weight percent. At these low concentrations, there is still a very high number of contact points because of the large size of the tracer particles. But the rigidity of the, of the network is probably not high enough to cage them. And as a consequence, the diffusion of these large spheres uh, appear to be governed by viscosity. And this has been shown to happen for the combination of very large particles and dynamic network. So this table then, um, it summarizes the results from the tracer diffusion measurements showing that below 0.2 or approximately 0.2 weight percent, the CNF network is highly dynamic. But at higher concentrations, a more rigid network is uh, created for which the diffusion of small particles is, uh, is viscosity governed while the larger particles become caged by the network. And we found this caging phenomenon uh, quite intriguing since it appeared at low concentrations, the uh, water content in these dispersions is 99.8%. Uh, so it's not a lot of cellulose in there. Uh, so we wanted to see what would happen for even larger particles that normally sediments in water. So we studied the sedimentation velocity of silica particles in CNF dispersions and compared it with the sedimentation in water. And we could see that already at a cellulose content of uh, 0.05 weight percent, it did have a significant impact on the sedimentation velocity. And if we increased the concentration to 0.2 weight percent, the sedimentation was considerably slowed down. For the largest silica particles, the sedimentation velocity was only 1% of its value in water. So these results show us that CNFs can be used at rather low concentrations to stabilize uh, other particles dispersions. So I will now move on to presenting the second part where we have used different strategies to alter the colloidal interactions in CNF systems. <coughs> in paper three we studied the counter ion dependent interactions by studying the swelling of CNF networks in the presence of different counter ions. We formed cellulose or CNF nanopapers and we soaked them in different salt solutions to change the counter ion. Uh, 
After equilibration in water, we measured the thickness of the nanopaper and compared it with the dry thickness. And the swelling can then be related to the strength of the network, which is then caused by the uh, attractive interactions within the system. And the results from these swelling measurements showed that, that we had a very big variation in swelling in presence of different counter ions. Uh, the swelling decreased with increasing valency, but we also saw large differences for ions of equal valency. And this cannot be explained by the DLVO theory in which the ions are treated as point charges that do not interact. So we needed to consider other types of interactions to explain these results. And the interactions that we found likely to affect this behavior is first of all the attractions that are induced by correlations in the fluctuations of the ionic clouds of neighboring particles. And this interaction exists for all types of charged particles, but it increases with increasing surface charge density and ion valency. There is also some specific ion effects, such as dispersion interactions that uh, can act between uh, ions or between ions and the surface. So the, this is then uh, like the same thing as the van der Waals uh, attraction, but it can also be applied to the ions. And this interaction increases in magnitude with the uh, polarizability of the ions. Some ions also form metal ligand complexes with the carboxyl groups on the CNF surfaces. And some ions form complexes with the hydroxide ions of water. And this can locally decrease the pH, with the, which then reduces the double layer repulsion. So we first evaluated the influence of the metal ligand complexes by plotting the swelling versus uh, the stability constant of the ion ligand pair for the multivalent ions that we used. And we could see that for most ions, the swelling did uh, decrease with increasing complex stability, which is what one would expect. But for the ions that form the weakest complexes, calcium and barium, the opposite trend was actually observed. And for comparative reasons, we did the same experiment with the Montmorillonite clay films. So this clay does not contain any complex forming ligands. Uh, so therefore, uh, no complexes should be formed. And here we could actually see the same trend for calcium and barium, while the other ions, uh, their swelling seemed to be mainly governed by valency. So we then um, plotted swelling versus polarizability to evaluate the impact of the dispersion interactions. And for CNFs in combination with monovalent ions, uh, we could see that, uh, dis that the swelling decreased with increasing polarizability, indicating that the dispersion interactions uh, do have, uh, are important in these systems. We did the same thing for CNFs and MMTs in the presence of multivalent ions. And we could see that for the more uh, polarizable ions, calcium and barium, swelling was decreased. But for the other multivalent ions, the polarizability was probably too low to have any significant impact on the swelling. Um, for copper ions, we were not able to find any reliable values for the polarizability. And that is why these values are just indicated by the horizontal lines. This graph shows up, uh, sums up the results for the uh, multivalent ions. Uh, so for all these systems, there are ion-ion correlations, which increases in significance with the, for the trivalent ions. Magnesium ions are not particularly polarizability and they do not form strong complexes with carboxyl groups. So that is why the swelling in presence of magnesium is the largest. If we use the more polarizable ions, calcium or barium, we have significant dispersion, inter dispersion interactions, which decreases the swelling. And for the other ions, uh, they form metal ligand complexes with the carboxyl groups and therefore increase the attraction within the system and decreases swelling. Um, so in paper four, we used polyethylene glycol, PEG, and grafted it to the surface, surfaces of the CNFs. And the aim was to increase the colloidal stability by steric stabilization. 
we used PEG of molecular weights of 1 or 20 kilodaltons, and we targeted grafting densities corresponding to 1 or 20 percent of the surface carboxyl groups. And we used or we chose these uh, rather low grafting densities since we wanted our systems to contain more CNFs than PEG. We did not want just cellulose embedded in a matrix of PEG. And we evaluated uh, the effect on the colloidal behavior by studying um, how the transition concentration for the arrested state formation was changed. And we detected that using the same methods as in paper one, the DLS measurements and the uh, inverted cuvette tests. So this table shows the CNF concentrations at which the uh, transition occurred for the different samples. And we could see that uh, the transition concentration was slightly increased by grafting the samples. Uh, we also had uh, quite large variations in the results for some of the uh, grafted samples. We obtained correlation curves at different concentrations. At 0.3 weight percent, uh, all the samples are still at dispersions, but we can see a difference for the uh, grafted and ungrafted samples. And that is that the correlation of the, un of the grafted sample starts to uh, decay earlier than for the gra ungrafted sample. And this shows us that the mobility of the grafted CNFs is actually higher than for the ungrafted. At 0.6 weight percent, the intercept of the correlation curve for the ungrafted CNF has decreased. And this was expected since it has formed an arrested state at this concentration. But the other sample set has also formed arrested states, but the intercepts are still high. And we are not used to seeing this for uh, CNF systems. And this then indicates that the mobility of the CNFs are, are still higher than for the ungrafted CNFs, even though. Uh, an arrested state has formed. And we believe that this is due to uh, the formation of a lubricating layer of PEG on the CNF surfaces, which then decrease the interfibrillar friction. In paper five, we continued to study systems consisting of CNF and PEG, but in this case, we used PEG as an additive instead of grafting it. Uh, and we wanted to study the if we could increase the redispersibility of completely dried CNF. Except for PEG, we used two other polymers as well. We used the carboxymethyl cellulose, CMC, and lignin, which was obtained by fractionation of lignoboost craft lignin. We used two different methods for the drying and the redispersion of the CNF. So the CNF and polymer mixtures were dried either by freeze drying or by forming nanopapers. The freeze dried CNFs were redispersed and the nanoscale redispersibility was evaluated by measuring changes in particle size by DLS measurements. The nanopapers were also redispersed and the obtained dispersions were used to form new uh, nanopapers. And we could then evaluate the macro scale redispersibility by comparing the mechanical properties of the nanopapers formed from redispersed CNFs to that of nanopapers formed from never dried CNFs. And we also studied the nanoscale redispersibility of the redispersed nanopapers by measuring the particle sizes. So the results from the freeze-dried uh, CNFs uh, is shown here in this graph. Uh, on the y-axis, we have the ratio between the hydrodynamic diameter of the redispersed sample to that of the original dispersion. The dashed line indicates a value of one, which would mean a perfect redispersion. So we could see that by increasing the amount of any type of the additives that we used, we could improve the redispersibility. Uh, for CMC and PEG, this was probably achieved by the formation of hydrated layers uh, around the CNFs, which then facilitate their separation upon re-wetting. But the best results was actually achieved with lignin, where we the, the redispersibility was improved greatly at just additions of 5 weight percent. So we wanted to study this system more in detail in order to understand this uh, redispersing phenomenon. So we performed colloidal probe AFM measurements 
where we measured the interactions between a CNF-coated silica particle and a CNF-coated mica surface in the presence of uh, or in a lignin dispersion and in pure water. So on, in the graphs on your right hand side, you can see uh, the forces upon approach of the particle and the surface, which is indicated by the red lines. And the blue curves shows the force upon retraction. And if we look at the graph uh, for the water samples, then we could see uh, that there is a significant adhesion between the CNFs, which is shown by the blue retraction curve. In the inset, we compare the uh, approach force with theoretical curves according to the DLVO theory. And we can see that there is actually a very good agreement indicating that in these systems, the uh, repulsive force is mainly gi given by the uh, double layer interactions. But when we introduce lignin in the system, the blue curves show us that the adhesion between the CNFs is removed. And uh, in the, uh, on the uh, approach uh, curves, they no longer agree with the theoretical GLBO uh, curves. And we believe that this is because of um, a new repulsive contribution that has a steric origin. And that this steric repulsion and the uh, diminished uh, adhesion can then explain the improved redispersibility in the presence of lignin. The next step was to evaluate the macro scale redispersibility. So we measured the mechanical properties of nanopapers formed from redispersed CNF and for nanopapers formed from never dried CNFs. And we could see that the mechanical properties were actually very similar for all samples, regardless on if never dried or redispersed CNF was used. This was also the case for the CNF uh, where we didn't add an additive. So this shows us that for the preparation of CNF nanopapers that can uh, that maintain their mechanical properties after redispersion, additives are actually unnecessary. And this result could either mean that the nanoscale aggregation that we detected in the particle size measurements, they either do not uh, affect the macro scale mechanical properties, or the result could mean that the uh, aggregation that we see for the freeze dried sample can be avoided if the CNFs are dried by forming nanopapers instead. So therefore we measured the particle sizes of the redispersed nanopapers and compared it with that of the redispersed freeze dried CNF. And we could see that when we did not use an additive, uh, the change in particle size was very big for the freeze dried, uh, um, the re redispersed freeze dried CNFs and the redispersed uh, CNF nanopapers. So by drying the CNFs by forming nanopapers, the aggregation can actually to a large extent be avoided. So in this work, we showed two different strategies for improving the redispersibility of CNFs. Either the CNFs can be freeze dried in the presence of an additive, preferably lignin or something with a similar structure, or the CNFs can be dried by forming nanopapers. And these nanopapers can then be redispersed even without an additive. So to summarize uh, the work that I have presented here today, we have studied arrested states formed by concentration increase and found that they form probably due to uh, particle mobility constraints and that they can be classified as colloidal glasses. But if the double layer repulsion is decreased, another type of arrested state is obtained, which is based on attractive interactions and it can be classified as a colloidal gel. We studied the dynamics in CNF systems and found that below a concentration of approximately 0.2 weight percent, a highly dynamic CNF network is obtained, but at higher concentration, a more rigid network is, is formed, which can then cage larger particles and prevent their diffusion or sedimentation. We changed the colloidal interactions by changing the counter ion to the CNF charges. And we found that in order to explain the colloidal behavior of CNFs, um, 
uh, ion-ion correlation interactions and specific ion effects need to be uh, considered. And we could increase the, uh, the arrested state threshold concentration by grafting the CNFs with PEG, and this also increased the mobility of the CNFs in the arrested state. We, uh, um, we changed the uh, colloidal interactions by adding additives to the CNFs, and this um, uh, increased the redispersibility of a free stride CNF. And we also showed that by forming a CNF nanopaper, a redispersible dry CNF could be obtained even without the use of additives. So with that, I would like to conclude by first of all acknowledging Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation for funding my PhD projects. I would like to thank my main supervisor, Lars Bogberg, for all the support during these years, as well as my co-supervisors, Lars Ödberg, Torbjörn Pettersson and Andreas Fall. I'd like to thank all of my co-authors and co-workers, both at Wallenberg Wood Science Center and in the Fiber Technology Group. And thanks to all of you who have listened today. Thank you.